my trust because he is the center of it all he is the center of my life my family's life this church his church and this world and if anyone can do it it is him he did the impossible in my life he can do the impossible in your life but he must be the center of it all be the center of it all oh God from my heart to you, oh God, be the center. Because nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Oh Jesus, be the center. From the beginning to the end, it will always be its all. It's always been you. It's always been you. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of it all. Yes, Lord. From the beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. It all Lord. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end. From beginning to the end. Everything in between. You will always be. And it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus at the center of my life. At the center of my life. Be the center of my life. My life. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And amen. Be the center of my life. Be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. From my heart.
trusting you to hear my yes and leave. of the song that we've been singing this morning I surrender I give you my all I say yes I could just imagine perhaps some of the hundreds that are listening to us through the internet they're saying What's this all about? I don't feel that way. I mean, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. But surrender everything to him? I mean, I don't even know him. I can think of a young lady that I've known for Oh, I think I've known since she was a little baby. And uh, if a young man would have stopped her on the street, excuse me, miss. Yes, can I help you? 
Would you marry me? And be my wife? And obey me and follow me? Who are you? Uh, excuse me, don't follow me. And yet, that same lady, young girl, didn't meet that boy on the street like that, like I just showed you, but she just met him one day. And then she sort of said, oh, he's kind of handsome. Where are you from? Atlanta, where's that? And then she traveled here to visit us. And then they began to talk. And she began to like him. More and more and more. And then she began to think, hmm, I wonder what it would be like to be with him. And then, as they spent more time together, she went to visit her family. Her family went to visit her family. He went to visit her family. And things got a little more serious. And then one day, that young man said, Flor, ¿te casas conmigo? And you know what she said? Yes, Jess. Yes, Jess. You see the difference? When you get to know somebody, you say, I wonder what my life would be like if I could follow him. How different would my life be if I did what he said and not what I've wanted to do all my life and it never works out I wonder if he has the answers I wonder if instead of doing what I think is right and getting into all sorts of trouble Having a family like I think it should be, and having my kids say, I hate you, Dad. I hate you, Mom. I can't wait to get out of here. I wonder, I wonder if he would make a difference in my life, in my marriage, in my family in my finances. I wonder if he knows better than me. And see, that was what they were singing this morning. That's what they were saying. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Because you love me as no one could ever love me. When I was in my sins, you loved me. And you gave your life for me. And if you can do something with this mess I've made of my life, 
Then I say, I surrender. That's what we were singing. And yes, I know, because that's my story too. That's my story too. And I've learned that saying yes to what he wants has meant for me the most wonderful life I could ever have dreamed of living. That's why I can relate with those songs. I can, really can. Because it's the story of my life and of everyone that has met him and gotten to really know him. See, it's not just seeing him from far away in a book or in a Bible or in a church or hear about him. It's so different when it's personal. When you hear his voice, listen to his love and his care. That makes all the difference. And I can testify as many as you can also today that he made all the difference in our life. Anyone say amen to that? Amen. And not only will he be our helper, our guide, our healer, our provider, our Savior, but he, by his own words, is the builder of a mansion. Even while we're here, he said to his disciples, I go and I'm going to build a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. So we can, after this earth, we can rise up with wings as eagles to his eternal dwelling, to live with him truly happier ever after. Hallelujah. That's the Jesus I know. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. There's so many descriptions or titles I could give to this message. But I think uh, I'll just leave it to you to figure out your own. How are we identified in the world? How are Christians identified in the world? That would be one of the titles. The Jews are known by their rituals, by the uniqueness of their way of dressing, by the kippah on their head. You can identify the Muslims also. You can identify the Hindus, the sheiks with the big turban and the hair they don't cut. And uh, those from India with a red dot on their forehead. The ladies with the nice, beautiful Indian dresses. But how can we identify? You say, oh, I wear a little cross. No, not really. How did Jesus say that we can identify as followers of him? Those that have been in the military, they identify themselves perhaps with a patch, or the way they address you, perhaps one of the few people in the States that says, Sir. Others were identifying objects, 
a pendant, a ring, to identify themselves. Others tattoo that identification on their skin or their face or their neck. I saw a guy that uh, had escaped and he was caught within a matter of hours. I mean, like this, that quickly couldn't hide. Why? Because he had tattooed all his face black except letters up here that said beast. Where can you hide? The only place he could hide is putting a ski mask and going into a bank. I don't know how long that would last. Yes, all they had to do is, this is how he identifies himself, the picture, and that was it. Hello, police? Yeah, he's right here. Yes, those are in gangs, identify themselves with the tattoos of identity of their gangs. From wherever they are, their loyalty to an organization. And you can easily identify them. But in the case of Christians, what is our means to identify? Wearing a little cross, a little fish, as a necklace. There is an identifying factor that Jesus told his disciples. But before I tell you what it is, I'd like to lay some groundwork. Starting in Matthew 22 and verse 36, there were these professors of the Old Testament law, the Torah of the Jews. There were two groups, one was called the Pharisees and the other the Sadducees. And my father used to say, how could you identify them? He said, well, because one were sad, you see, and the others were fair, you see. And they came to Jesus to see if he could help them solve a problem they had. And the problem they had was about the law that they were always arguing with each other as to what, what position the, the commandments had in the law. And of course, at that time, when they asked Jesus this question, they had published over 600 laws that included the Ten Commandments, and people were supposed to keep them all. How many steps you can, you can take on a Sabbath, whether if your donkey falls in a, in a hole on a Sabbath, if you can take him out or not, it depends on how the sun, how the wings, how the wind, how the this, how the that. 600 and some laws. And poor people trying to remember until they finally said, oh, forget about it. Why? Because they had divided the laws into greater and smaller commandments. But the argument was between them, which one of those greater is the greatest? So that's why when they came to Jesus, they asked, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. we read this, Master, which is the greatest, the great, commandment of the law. Some said that the most important laws were the ones concerning the sacrifice of the animals. Others, no, the most important ones are the ones about circumcision because if it not for circumcision that was given to Abraham, we could not identify as Jews. Now, I didn't put circumcision as a way of identifying a Jew because you don't know. You can't tell. 
Others saying that the most important laws had to be with purification and the way you washed your hands. But Jesus answered, and this is strange. I know you've heard this before, but this is very strange. He answered in Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, you want to know which is the biggest of them all, the most important? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. They said, what? That's not even part of the law. That's not even a commandment. What Torah do you read from? Wasn't one of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses to give to God's people. You might remember how that came to be, that Moses went up. You can take that down. Moses went up to the mountain of Sinai. God was there with thunders and lightnings. And God told Moses, take a tablet. Well, I've got one, but it wasn't like this. And it said that God, with his own finger, he wrote on one side of the tablet and on the other side of the tablet. And this is what he wrote. Ten Commandments. You shall not have other gods before me. Two, you shall not make idols. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor or lie. And you shall not covet. Can you imagine? How many laws do you think there might be in the world? I mean, how many laws do you think there's in our county? How many laws do you think there is in the state of Georgia? How many laws do you think there's in the United States? A million? I mean, there's a lot of them, believe me. If you ever read the small print, I mean, it's huge. Laws, so society can sort of live with each other. Laws about if you don't obey these laws, I'll put you in jail. Laws about custody, uh, laws about husband and wife, laws about abuse, laws about this, about that. And with all those laws, look at the news. They don't work. There's so many that if they arrest you and, and you go to a judge and you say, what am I arrested for? Because you're ugly. I said, is that a law? Of course it is. I didn't know that. And you know what he'll tell me? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Go to jail. Yes. All those laws. Can you just imagine? 
if humanity would just obey these 10 simple rules? Could you imagine if people wouldn't fight over religion because they would not have any other God? There's just one, the one that created us, the only God. And how do you know there isn't any other God? You know what God said, and it's written? It said, I saw all these people worshiping these idols and other gods. He was saying it cynically, of course. He said, so I decided to go and search. Maybe there was another God. And he said, I went through all the universe under every stone. I didn't find any God except for me. So can you imagine? Do you imagine how it would be in the world if there was no religious wars, which are the worst wars of all, the most savage of wars are the religious ones. Can you imagine if they all honored one God? If no one would make idols of anything, whether of people, of singers, nobody would be super special, super rich. No more idols. How about this? No more cursing. How about this? Keep the Sabbath day. How about this? It's all the slave drivers would let people have a full free day a week. Can you imagine that? Your boss now said, you got to come in on Saturday. We got this project to finish. Well, but here, I was going to go out with my family. Sorry. Can you imagine? You get a full day to do nothing. How about this one? Honor your father and your mother. That would change society right there. How about this one? You shall not kill. Could you imagine? No need for jails. Could you imagine no more killing in the world? There wouldn't be any wars. They'd just fight with chess. Let's play a game of chess, see who wins. Simple. How about this? How do you like this one? You shall not steal. Has anyone ever stolen from you? I hate thieves. I really do. Can you imagine a world where politicians didn't steal? Where government didn't steal? When corporations didn't steal? When nobody stole? Do you imagine how rich everyone would be? How about this one? You shall not lie. Bear fault witness against your neighbor. Could you imagine a world? First of all, there wouldn't be politics. It would not exist. They would probably elect the leaders by lottery. Okay, your turn now. Can you imagine a world without lies? Where did you go? Oh, well, you know, I, I can't lie. You shall not covet. You see someone that has a better car than you. People don't, I don't care. I don't like the color anyway. Can you imagine? Families without adultery, without lies. 
Could you imagine that? That almost sounds like heaven, does it? And yet, 10 simple laws. And you know what happened? Moses was so happy, he said, finally, we're going to be a beautiful, wonderful future for our nation. All they have to do is do these 10 things, and that's it. And he was walking down, carrying the tablet. And now we're in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 15. Moses turned and went down from the mount with the two tablets of the testimony that were in his hands. The tablets were written on both of their sides. On their one side and on the other they were written. Now Exodus 32, 19. And it came to pass, as soon as they came near to the camp, that he saw the calf and dancing, okay? The verses before that say that Joshua said, hey, I, I hear a sound. It sounds like a war. He said, no, they're actually singing and dancing. Well, wonder why. And Moses looked, and there they were dancing around an idol, a golden calf, Right there, they broke the first commandments. You shall not have other gods. And the second one, they said, you shall not make any idols. He was only gone for 40 days. Come on. So before you could even show them how to have a wonderful life, what God had prepared for them, they already broke two. In fact, they broke three because what they were doing is fornicating and celebrating, because that's how they celebrated in Egypt, that idol, lusting. So what did Moses did? He said, verse 19, again, Moses' anger waxed hot, and he threw down the tables from his hand, and they broke. So even before he was able to show the people God's answer, for them as a nation, they had already broken three of those commandments. And the other seven didn't really matter because if they couldn't do what God said, who's going to keep them from lying, from stealing, from killing? So where did Jesus get that commandment from? Well, it soon became obvious that there's no way the Jews would be able to keep those Ten Commandments unless there was some way that could make it happen. Some power greater than themselves to help them to keep those commandments, to empower them to obey the commandments. So Moses pleaded to God, give us another chance. He said, okay, come back up. I'll make you another set of original, not a copy, of original Ten Commandments. And he did. God came down, wrote the tablet again, but he said, now, wait a minute. Before you give these commandments, they're not going to be able to keep them. They weren't able to before, so how will they be able to keep them now? So that's where we go to Deuteronomy, chapter 6. In chapter 5, we have the tablets and the Ten Commandments again written. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 2. It says, so that you might fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes and commandments which I command thee, 
thou and your son and your son's son in all the days of your life, that the days of your life might be prolonged. In other words, God saying, if you obey my commandments, you'll live longer. But so you can do it. Verse 3, I want you to listen. Hear, O Israel. And observe to do this so it might go well with you that you might increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, verse 4. The Lord our God is one Lord. In verse 5. And you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and with all thy soul. God said, before I give you these commandments, I'll give you the key of how you can keep it. You shall love the Lord. And that's where Jesus took it to answer the Pharisees. He gave them the key. Not which one's the greatest, but the key to open the commandments. If you love, you will obey. If you love someone, you want to please. So God said, in order to fear the Lord and keep his commandments, observe and do it, you must love the Lord your God. Only love will enable you to obey, not fear. Fear does not cause you to obey. Not condemnation, not obligation, not even seeking a reward for obedience. The greatest power that exists in the universe is love. Why? Because God is made of love. The Apostle John wrote and said, God is love. He is. That's what he is. And he also said, God is light. So God is that what God is, love. That's the greatest power. That's what changed the world. That's what made our calendar to mark 2,022 years since Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born. Why? Because of love, he was born. It wasn't Alexander the Great with his power that changed the world. It wasn't the Persian king of all the kingdoms before him that changed the world. One thing changed the world forever. And that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why? Because God, love, so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's how much he loved. So that everyone that believes in him should not die or perish, but shall have eternal life. How did God decide he could change the world? With punishment? With suffering? No, with love. And Jesus so loved the Father 
that he obeyed and was obedient even to death, the death of the most cruel forms, that of crucifixion on a cross, in order to be able to save the world from their sins, to save the world. I believe if Jesus had not come, there probably wouldn't have existed a world today. Why? Because it was written that when God sent his son is because there was not one good, righteous man left on earth. The last one has died. So there was nothing Nothing that could contain sin and evil. Nothing can contain people from rising up in hatred because there was no more love on earth. Not one was left. That's why I said, that's why God sent his son to save the world. Or they would have soon destroyed each other and there'd be no world. That's what evil does. It destroys, destroys hearts, destroys marriages, destroys children, destroys society. Yes, love saves the world. Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, in chapter 8 and verse 38 said, speaking about the power of love. Romans 8 and verse 38. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the power of love. Nothing, not even death, can separate us. That's the power of love. Nor angels, nor demons, nor the highest powers of principalities. Now, or a year from now, or a century from now, nothing, not even an alien creature, can come and separate us from that love. That's how powerful the binding cords of love of God are. Nothing can separate us. And let's go back to where I started with what is the identifying mark of Christians. Jesus told us it was the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples in John chapter 13. Jesus, in just a few hours, would be taken by the soldiers bound in chains and a little time later would be crucified. It was his last meal with his disciples. He had finished the meal by wetting a piece of bread with the juice of the meat of the lamb that was left on his plate and that little piece of bread with broth 
To whoever he gave that was a person of privilege. And he gave that to Judas, the man that had betrayed him. And Judas got up off the table, ran to the door, opened the door and left. And there were 11 disciples left with Jesus. And that is when Jesus spoke these words. In verse 35 of John 13. He said to his disciples, by this shall everyone know that you are my disciples. The identification of a disciple of Jesus Christ. By this, everyone will know that you love one another. That is the sign of a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. It can be seen by anyone. Not by the dress. Not by what they say. Not by what they preach. Not by what they pretend. Not by how they dress. Or what they say. But because. They love. Because they love. Why do we love? It is written. Because he first loved us. And by loving us, cleansing us, he planted within us a little seed. Which grows to be a great mountain. The seed of God. The seed of becoming a son of God. God is love. So in us. When we are born again of Christ, love begins to grow within. A love that I have seen change lives. Love that I have seen change marriages that were on the brink of divorce. I've seen that little plant of love. Change everything. I've seen that little plant as it grows in the parents and they begin to love their children with love that comes from God. They begin to respond to that love. They begin to respect and honor as they see their father love their mother, and they see their mother love the father, and they see them both love him, her, something happens. In that rebellion, that fire of anger begins to swivel. I've seen, I've seen the transformation that only love, no law, no law can make somebody love. No law can force a man to love his wife or his wife to love her husband. No law except the power of love. Yes, by this will everyone know because you love. It is not a necklace. It's not a ring. It's not a tattoo on your body. It's a tattoo on his body. It's the mark 
of love. King Solomon wrote on the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, it said, Place me as a seal, a mark. In your heart. Not a tattoo on me. But place that mark on your heart. Or like a mark or seal on your arm. Because love is strong as death. Yes. His wounds for my sins, for my redemption, is my mark, my tattoo of love, but not on me, on his body. Those stripes by which I'm healed, those hands, I made those marks, my sins. If I would have been the only existing creature on earth, he would have died for me. I know that he died for me. I know that for my sins, he was marked permanently. He still has those marks. For my sins and my transgressions, he was wounded. It is written in Isaiah 53. Yes, my sins did that. That mark on him is the mark that says, I love you, John. I did it for you, to save you from yourself, to save you from your sins, to save you from the destructing power of sin, and plant in you love that will transform your life. Love. And how can we achieve that? How can we achieve that? Again, I refer you to John chapter 14 and verse 15. How can we achieve to obey him? How can we achieve to love him? How can we have that power of love? How can that happen with us? Jesus said in John 14, 15, Obey. If you love me, keep my commandment. He didn't say the commandments, the 600, what the world says. Just, just do what I say. It might be just a simple thing. Simple thing. If you love me, I'll ask you for something. And you do it. And if you do it, listen to this. Listen to this. If you do it, I'm going to pray to my Father and he'll send you another comfort. He'll send the Holy Spirit that will abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth in verse 17, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you will know him. He will dwell with you. He shall be in you. He will give you the power to overcome sin. He will give you the power to overcome everything that wants to destroy you, your family, your marriage your children. The Holy Spirit has been given by God for those that would just love him just a little bit enough to obey. Whatever he might ask you, that's all he asks. For him to ask the Father to give you the power that will change everything. The power that comes from the Spirit of God that is love. The power that's greater than life or death. 
a power that is greater than the demons themselves. The Spirit of God within us. Oh, yes, I want to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I want that power to overcome and not be made a slave by circumstances, by my sins. So if we love him and obey him, Inspired by that love, he will give us the enabling power of that love. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit within us. The power of love. There's a song I'd like to finish with. The song is called The Power of His Love. And it starts with someone saying, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I need so much. I need my heart to be changed, my life to be changed. So Lord, I come to you. That's how it starts. It's a man, a woman, a young man, a young woman, a child who is trapped in a prison and cannot free himself. And then he says in the second verse, Lord, I've come to see my weaknesses. Oh, blessed is the man that recognizes his problems, his weaknesses. Bless him. Because until we do, until we can accept that we are sinners, we will never be able to take part of that power of love. He says, I recognize my weaknesses. I see them in me and I want them to be stripped away. Not by anything I can do, by reading a self-help book or trying to make things better. How many times have we tried to change? We cannot change ourselves. We'll always fall again. Because sin has a power and we will fall again and again and again. We cannot, we cannot win over evil, believe me. Just like you can't. Free yourself from addiction. You might want to, you might try, but you cannot. And sin is worse. Yes. He can stay, continue saying, oh, I see these weakness, weaknesses in me. Strip them away. Take them away by the power of your love. Can we sing, sing it? Do you identify? Is this, this talk about you? It talks about me. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. I've come to know the weaknesses I see. will be stripped away by the power of your love again, Lord. Lord, 
Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Let it be changed. Renew, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I come to Do you want more of that power in your life? Do you want that power of love in your life? Those unbreakable bounds that help from heaven. Then I want you to identify yourself. Say me. I want that power of love. So come and join me. Let us sing us together up here in front. We're saying, Lord, renew my mind and fill me with that power that will change everything in my life, that will change even my mind, my heart, that love that will change my family, my relationships, that will give me the power to overcome temptations, to overcome Jesus. Every day I need the power of your love because every day the world seems to want to convince me that things are different. But it's not that way. There's only one truth. And that is you, Jesus. You are the way, the life, the truth. The truth that saved this world from destruction. And it's your love that keeps this world still existing Lord fill me fill me and renew every day in my heart that love your love in me that will help me to love others 
not only my family, but love my brothers, my sisters, to love others. Like you said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will love also your neighbors, those that are around you. You will love as God loves. Lord, hold me close. Let your love surround me. As your will unfolds in my, in my life, living every day, by the power of your love. You know, love by its nature, by its nature, needs to share. Love is not loving yourself. When you have love, you just, you just love. Even your enemies. Poor little guy, you're suffering so much because you're so evil. Let me give you a hug. That's what love is. So when we sing again, why don't you do something? Find someone to give a hug to. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your enemy. I hope you don't have any enemies here. But just find someone to hug. No, no, wait. Don't let go. Let's read this. It says, hold me close. Hold. Cornelia needs a hug. your guitars. Your leave your guitars. No, no, leave your guitars. By the power of your leave your guitar. Go hug someone down there. How about your mom? How about your wife? Give her a hug.
an eagle you know what that means it means you lift up from the world from our problems from everything that binds us to this world and this system and you just see things in a different way suddenly things that are giants when you're up there, they're just so tiny. You say, why do I make myself worry about this tiny little thing? Because as you see things from the perspective of love, everything looks different. The impossible is possible. Yes, but we have, we have to lift up and we can't unless unless love lifts us up and we can see as Jesus sees us as he sees us and the world as God sees it it's so different yes I love to soar and I will soar with you your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for coming to this world leaving your kingdom of glory and light coming to this filthy world be born in a manger be 
because you loved us. Thank you for your love. Thank you because you didn't leave us alone after you resurrected from the cross and overcame death by the power of love. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone, but you sent your Holy Spirit. that lives within us to give us the power to overcome the obstacles that are in front that we might be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Hallelujah come on lead us in a song of victory.